it in about a minute. Let's just give everyone a chance to dial in. Uh, we're doing this session slightly differently. Usually we do it as a webinar where you're not able to see everyone's uh, pictures and audio uh, is, uh, can be unmuted. So here uh, we want to make it more interactive. Uh, so we'd ask you to keep your, you can leave your videos on, but uh, put yourselves on mute uh, for now. Uh, so hopefully we won't have to police that. <laughs> um and we're gonna get started shortly uh really looking forward to the session uh just uh and i'm going to repeat myself later on as well but in the uh, chat window we have uh put in a link for question and answers so if while we wait for people to start uh if you guys could just go to this link um on Slido, which is, appears in your chat window, uh, that's where you can ask your questions and you can uh, upvote other people's questions as well. Uh, another point of housekeeping uh, as we wait, uh, there is another link I'm gonna put in, which is for joining the breakout rooms. Uh, we have put together a Google Doc that should appear in your chat window as well, where you can go in and choose which breakout session you want to participate in in the second half of the session. All right, we're close to about 70 people now. So let's uh, get started. Hi, uh, my name is Shujia Keen. I am the president of the MIT Club of Northern California. And today we have a very interesting session. Uh, a lot of us wanted to contribute and help. And we figured that, you know, getting PPE to the folks who need it is the easiest and very tangible way of helping very quickly. Little did we know that we were entering into this world of, uh, you know, international trade warfare uh, with a, a lot of like confiscations going on, price gouging, et cetera. So, we did what we know best is get some of the brightest minds. Uh, we're all working on different aspects of fixing the mass shortage and PPE shortages. And we wa wanted to bring them all together to uh, discuss what they're seeing, but then also get all of you to participate in this discussion to say, how can you help in this process? What are you guys seeing? And if there is any initiative you'd want to join and participate in, uh, please feel free to do do so. Um, with that, uh, so our agenda, I'm going to do a quick round of introductions. Uh, uh, actually, I'm just going to ask, uh, you know, do a quick introduction, and then we're going to have three overview sessions, one on the adventures in the PPE supply chain and what we've, uh, what we've seen. The second part is around sort of the hacking of new solutions, whether it's new materials or innovative solutions coming out of labs or individual efforts. And then the third aspect of this discussion is uh, talking about how do you sort of ensure the highest quality of protection gear, right? Uh, and then uh, you know, that takes us to roughly around two o'clock and then we're gonna break off into three breakout rooms. Um, and the Google Sheet is in the chat window. I'm gonna uh, put that in again. Please go to that uh, Google Sheet and uh, express your interest where you'd wanna be. Um, uh, which room you want to join and then uh, Serena who's our club admin will take care of that uh, you know before the breakout rooms uh, you know br breakout sessions start uh, and then we'll all come back together and do a quick wrap up so just as a quick background for those of you who have not joined uh, the club of northern california events before we're uh, one of the most active mit clubs outside of boston uh, you know the, the purpose of the organization is to help connect MIT alumni with each other and back with the Institute and to, to help support MIT's mission of leveraging science and technology to create a better world. Uh, you know, we've got close to about 15,000 alums in the Bay Area. We do around 200 events, 9,000 people attend our events a year and it's all um, volunteer run and sort of the proceeds we sort of generate from any of our events help support uh, scholarships uh, and to date we've sent about 200 kids on scholarships to MIT. So we have a, an esteemed panel uh, here with us but we have a very special guest who's just joined in. 
uh, straight from Cambridge. So I'm going to hand over the mic to Whitney Espick, who's the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and she'll share some thoughts with us in terms of what's happening in the ground in Cambridge and how MIT is participating in this. So over to you, Whitney. Hi, Whitney, you're on mute. Thanks, Shuja. It's great to be with everyone today, and I'm so glad to have this chance to uh, let you know a little bit about what's going on on campus in um, Cambridge, Metro Boston, and uh, then to send you on your way to do some great thinking about how we might address this set of issues even more thoughtfully. Um, so certainly, as the rest of the country has also experienced, Metro Boston is pretty much on shutdown, and we're doing pretty well with flattening the curve, but it is the case that we don't have enough PPE for our medical professionals. Some of you may have seen a video out of MIT with a laser Edelman uh, professor uh, who heads IMS at MIT and is also a cardiac surgeon saying he gets one mask a day and he's doing surgery. Um, some things have improved in the three weeks uh, since he said that was the case, but not a lot. Uh, so as things shut down, MIT wanted to try and help, as did many of the universities in our, in our metro area. And we all ransacked our labs and centers and found all the appropriate masks and shields and gowns and swabs that we could find to share with the medical community in Boston. And that was over about 200,000 pieces. But that doesn't go too far when we have something that seems to be as long lasting as the situation we're all in together. Uh, so uh, MIT started looking around for other ways to uh, source PPE. Why do we need to do that? I think we all know we're having this conversation because something is broken. There's not a centralized supply chain that's working and doing this distribution. And so uh, individual groups turned to trying to figure it out for ourselves. At the same time, we had uh, several MIT alumni in the greater China region, uh, Beijing, Taiwan, Shanghai, and Hong Kong, raise their hands and say, we have connections, we have uncles, we have kids we went to, or we have friends we went to elementary school with who are in this business. Can we link ourselves up with you all at MIT and your procurement people and help you get things in? Simultaneously, they set up a fundraising effort to uh, pay up front for those kinds of uh, masks and gowns and swabs because the merchants certainly want, are expecting right now to be paid up front. So it was a two-pronged effort led by the um, combined efforts of the Greater China Clubs. And that has led to several thousand um, PPE items coming into MIT in a gradual way of testing. I just share this as you all think about solutions. Uh, first, they sent small samples of less than a thousand to try and get them through U.S. Customs, and then when that worked, we started increasing increasing the quantity, and that seems to be continuing to work. Part of our solution has been possible because there's an MIT person in the State House at um, Mass uh, in Massachusetts who works on the governor's team and is a supply chain expert. So we had an inside contact. So I just share that networks have helped every step of the way in solving this set of problems for the Boston area. Um, so that's sort of what we were trying to do to share PPE and share masks, which is your, your main focus today. In addition, of course, we have um, faculty and uh, who have been working on developing new products. You may have seen the event uh, ventilator, it's DIY. You can make it for about $100 in parts. Um, and that's happening in the Metro New York area quite effectively. It just got FDA approval last week. There's a team of MIT alumni in Mexico who have pulled together and are working on manufacture and distribution as an example. So uh, you know, the story that I see is MIT people saw a problem, MIT faculty and MIT alumni, and uh, you pulled together in ways to help uh, our institution and our geographical area solve it. But I think there's potential to apply that model elsewhere. Uh, the Alumni Association, I'm proud to say, played a connective tissue role, and that is how that should be. And I am grateful to the Club of Greater China um, uh, for their work and cooperation and to the other alumni and to this club as well for thinking in a collaborative, collective way. Uh, I, can't, I won't go through the list now, but just for you all to know, there are experts in many parts of the world in different pieces of this supply chain, including uh, two big, big-ish nonprofits that are actually able to source million uh, piece quantities into the United States, each with a different MIT affiliated founder, and I can share those names with Shuja. Uh, so just know you have many resources to pull on, including what's in your own network and your own uh, powerful brains. 
So thank you for coming together to uh, work on this. And um, I apologize, I need to slip out to go to a faculty meeting, uh, Zoom-wise, here at MIT, but I will get a readout on all of the great work that's, that's going on. Shuja, was Thank you so much, Brittany. Really appreciate you joining in in short notice. And uh, we'll keep you abreast and you know, out of the breakout session, they are gonna be us and we'll sure to pass them along to you. So appreciate it. Wonderful, uh, thank with you. This, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna move on to the next session, which is adventures in the PPE supply chain. So I'm gonna move on to the slides and I'm gonna hand it over to Sean to take it from here. Great, thank you, Shuja. Uh, it's nice to have everybody here. It's great to see all the interest in uh, in uh, learning and potentially getting involved. You know, just to to kind of set the stage here, uh, one of our our key goals here is really to to turn this conversation into a call to action, um, a way to harness uh, efforts. I think one of the things that Shuja shared with me when we got into this was uh, was the 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 idea that there's a lot of people that are keen to help, they may even be helping, I was in the same situation, and there would be an opportunity, couldn't there be an opportunity to harness all our efforts so that we're all rowing in the same direction? Turns out that the problems are super complex, uh, and what we'll uh, spend the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes on uh, is a whole host of learnings that we've uh, uh, examined, uh, or that we've uh, come to, to discover uh, as we've been trying to, to uh, uh, lean into the supply chain that actually provides uh, PPE, PPE to the healthcare industry. Um, just as a quick basics, in case you don't know what PPE actually stands for, personal protective equipment. What does that mean? Uh, it means masks. Uh, there's a couple of different varieties of masks, uh, N95 masks, which is what uh, hospital staff, healthcare staff, nursing home staff, they ultimately need. They're constantly exposed. Um, to pathogens in the air, and, uh, and these are the gold standard for uh, what they use to do their work day to day, uh, along with uh, uh, first responders and everybody else who comes uh, potentially in contact with virus. Uh, surgical masks, um, these are oftentimes used to uh, provide to patients uh, gowns uh, that they need to make sure that uh, virus doesn't travel uh, uh, on people's clothes or on their, their bodies, gloves, sanitizers, thermometers, these are very basic raw materials that people need uh, in order to be able to deal with uh, treating and uh, uh, diagno diagnosing and treating uh, uh, people with uh, infections. Uh, it turns out because healthcare is relatively a low margin business, uh, 80 to 90% of healthcare organizations, uh, they run super efficiently. Uh, and so they tend to maintain less than two weeks of supply uh, and as a result, uh, there is a whole lot of rigidity in the system and the ability to dynamically adjust their supply chains to uh, a massive uh, shock, a, a shock uh, or a massive event like what we're dealing with with, uh, with COVID-19 uh, ends up creating a whole lot of stress on the system to the point where uh, we just don't have adequate raw materials and that leads to uh, people dying. Uh, and that's a very, very sad state of affairs for us, but uh, that's why we're here. Uh, hopefully we can uh, find some ways to help. So just to give you a size, you know, kind of a sense of scale, um, many of you may not fully appreciate how large of a scale of a problem this really is. You know, we hear about things like Apple procuring 10 million masks that they're going to provide. Uh, we hear about Gavin Newsom here in California, at least. We hear about Gavin Newsom uh, signing up a deal for 200 million masks, um, either a year or a month. It's unclear exactly what the what the specific deals are, but 200 million masks uh, uh, in order to provide to the healthcare industry. You know, it sounds like those are pretty large numbers, but does that actually uh, achieve what we ultimately need? Well, it turns out there's a few interesting details here. The single largest provider of masks in the U.S. is uh, 3M. Um, they are essentially the IBM of masks, like you're not going to get fired for procuring 3M masks. Uh, they are currently producing roughly 420 million pieces per year. And we're going to focus, these, these, these specific numbers are relevant to the N95 masks, but keep in mind that every single form of PPE, surgical mask alike, sanitizer, gowns, they all have similar uh, sizes and scales and scope of the challenges that are being um, uh, uh, faced by the healthcare industry. Uh, and so 3M is the, the single largest provider and this is where most of the healthcare industry procures uh, their masks, their N95 masks from. Uh, 3M produces 420 million pieces per year. Uh, they've committed by the end of the year to ramp this up to 840 million pieces per year. 
How far does that get us? Well, if we're at 840 million pieces per, per year, the estimated demand for this prolonged period where we're gonna be dealing with COVID-19 is roughly 4.3 billion masks per year. These are some staggering numbers that we have to, to somehow uh, um, stand up a supply chain to be able to solve. And there are some models that predict worst case demand uh, to, uh, to, to exceed 7 billion pieces per year. Hopefully we're not in that world. Uh, hopefully we're gonna be able to, to kind of go through all our measures and be able to, to um, not have to deal with uh, needs and demand for at that size and scale. But as you can see, there is a significant gap for what we need to get to. Even with 3M ramping up their production, uh, we're still only 30% of the way there, 20 to 30% of the way there. So who are we? Um, you know, who did Shuja, you know, kind of draft into this, uh, this, this uh, conversation here? Uh, I'm a technology founder and executive and investor uh, for going on 20 some odd years. Uh, a few of us got together as part of this conversation to, to try to, to provide some kind of structure and scope here. Uh, I've been doing a whole bunch of business over the last several years uh, with Asia and so I happen to have connections there. Uh, you heard about John, who's uh, very active with the MIT community in, uh, uh, in Asia and has been helping with a, a number of our efforts there. Uh, Max Altman uh, with his brother, uh, Sam Altman, uh, who you might be familiar with, with Y Combinator. Uh, Max Altman, or who was recently uh, for 10 years uh, the CEO of, the CEO of, uh, of, of uh, uh, Y Combinator. Uh, Max Altman, uh, he runs a product at a company called Rippling. Uh, and uh, together, him and his brother have founded the Billion Masks uh, Initiative uh, with a goal to, to acquire a billion surgical masks. Uh, and then Tian, uh, uh, Tian is uh, uh, an investor and tech executive. He's been uh, spending a lot of time uh, importing and exporting and dealing with getting product in and out of China. Uh, we all individually, uh, for our own motivations, uh, decided we wanted to help uh, however we can. Uh, and what we knew was that we had a lot of relationships that we thought we'd be able to leverage uh, and decided to just help. And so we had a pretty simple idea. Uh, Shuja, if you want to go ahead and move on to the next slide here. We had a pretty simple idea, uh, you know, kind of at, at surface level seemed like a really great idea. Uh, we've got uh, a whole bunch of relationships to factories and uh, manufacturers in Asia and other parts of the world. Uh, we knew that they have, they have lots of masks, and we knew here in uh, the U.S. and North America and abroad, uh, we needed lots of masks. So what we thought we would do is, let's go see if we can just uh, purchase some of these masks or figure out a way to connect these people that have lots of masks to people that need lots of masks. And we thought the problem would be solved. And I think all of us, through our own journeys, uh, discovered that it turns out that it was a hornet's nest of a whole set of problems uh, and complexities that I think none of us fully uh, had, had a real appreciation for. And part of uh, this whole conversation is to discover and find people that have expertise and knowledge and skills that uh, uh, would be really helpful uh, as we go and figure out how to, to, to bridge the gap on an unprecedented um, challenge. Uh, and so uh, let me uh, hand it over to Max for a few minutes here to talk about uh, uh, their project that they're working on, with Billion Mask, you know, the Billion Mask Initiative, uh, talk about some learnings and uh, um, observations that they've gone through. Uh, my personal experience is, uh, has also come from trying to procure in high volumes some suppliers, and I'll talk about that here in a second. But I think, uh, I think Max uh, 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 would love to, to hear, I think everyone here would love to hear some of the learnings that they've had from their initiative. Uh, Max, can I hand that over to you? Awesome. Uh, thanks, Sean, for the introduction. Um, so yeah, as he said, um, my name is Max Altman. I'm working with my brother, Sam, um, on this Billion Mask project, which I think, you know, Sean set the uh, kind of the background pretty well. It's like the number is staggering of how many we need. And he's just talking about N95s, um, you know, which is like the gold standard um, to protect for people seeing um, COVID patients. But we're also seeing shortages, like he said, in all different types of uh, PP, so we were really focused on surgical masks. And the way this got started um, is, you know, kind of similar to everyone's journey, which is we had people reaching out to us from private companies, governments, hospitals saying, we need more masks. Um, and we also had people where we had uh, connections mostly with people sourcing masks. And we said, we have masks. Um, so it didn't seem that hard. It's like, like you said, you know, there's people who need masks and there's people who 
have masks, let's make this work. Um, but as we both started digging into it quite a bit, we found that it's just much, much harder than we thought for reasons that we didn't realize. Um, you know, we're finding that people are both price and time sensitive, uh, meaning that they obviously care about the price that they're paying for masks, but they also need them now, which makes a very difficult, uh, you know, difficult problem saying everyone is like, we want masks, um, you know, delivered in five days. Can you do that? And the answer is not at the price that you want, because if you need to get at the price that you want, we need to see you um, put uh, you know, put orders in well in advance in China. Um, so then we also kind of had us figure out that uh, the U.S. has kind of been taking a decentralized approach um, to this, um, you know, where we don't, haven't been seeing, you know, for whatever reason at the federal level, massive purchasing power and setting up this kind of smooth supply chain of mass coming in. Um, so we're not able to get maybe the best price and the best smoothing of the timing of masks coming in. So the goal was like, how do we do what other countries might be doing and get together a large, a large order um, so we can get a great price um, that works for everyone and fix that time issue of constantly having product flowing in each, um, you know, kind of each week. So the goal, what we thought was going to happen was we were going to get together a bulk order, get a great price, and then every week have roughly 50 million uh, surgical masks delivered to Long Beach, California. And from there, we could work with um, supply chain experts to get them to people who we need. Um, as people will continue to talk about there, um, we found that there's just a lot of things. It's just not that simple. Um, and there's a lot of things from the way that financing works, to the way that customs leaving um, China, to the way that customs coming to the U.S. works, and then getting them to the people um, is very difficult. And, you know, I'm definitely happy to share kind of later on what we've learned, but that's sort of the highlight of what the project is uh, and where we are right now. Um. Yeah, and so uh, just to, to kind of recap there, and again, size and scope, you know, one of the things we've discovered is that, you know, masks typically, well, and I'll, you know, again, this, just to bring this back to N95 masks for a moment, M95 masks are roughly 50 cents a piece. And if we're talking about billions of pieces that we need each year, this is clearly a multi-billion dollar problem and gap that we need to solve. And it turns out, just moving all that money back and forth, exchanging the goods to get them where they go. Turns out there's a lot of pieces that create friction. And just like Max was uh, articulating, it's just this perfect storm of drivers that lead to this friction. And in short, what have we learned? Supply chain is hard. Uh, and the honest answer is we don't really know exactly what we're doing. Uh, and we're looking for ways that we can harness our efforts. And uh, most of our efforts are directed towards just trying to help uh, and obviously with a healthcare system that is um, kind of very much in reaction mode, um, you know, it's not like they necessarily have the time or even the experience to guide us through how we can get some goods uh, that would meet their needs. Uh, and so, you know, just to, to kind of spend a few minutes unpacking, you know, what really does make this so complex as we've been alluding to, um, you know, we've, we've sort of laid out a few, you know, kind of examples of the challenges that we've run into uh, in all of our respective experiences as we've been trying to, uh, um, to, to, to help uh, provide some additional supply uh, from some of the various sources that we've discovered in Asia. Um, before I dive into this, I do want to acknowledge that um, we're seeing a handful of questions come in. I think we're going to have time here in a couple of minutes to be able to tackle some of these questions. Uh, we only have a couple of slides left here. So uh, just to, to uh, set, set some context, we, we definitely see, uh, uh, see folks coming in, uh, see, see folks writing those questions in. So, um, so uh, let's talk about some of the challenges. Um, so, you know, one of the first sets of challenges, you know, just essentially starts from this immediate um, impedance that shows up. You've got factories and manufacturers that typically look for minimum order quantity quantities in the on the order of millions. Um, these days, we're seeing pieces, you know, prices quoted anywhere from three to six dollars. 
Uh, I personally, uh, my experience is uh, uh, largely uh, centered around working with a few suppliers. We've, we're, we're trying to, to work with some suppliers that would produce on the order of a million N95 masks per week. Uh, and we're getting quoted prices on the order of $5.50 uh, per unit right now. Uh, we just completed successfully a small test order uh, in the thousands of units. Uh, they just arrived this week, so this is very much a real-time thing. Uh, at roughly uh, five dollars per p or sorry, th uh, three dollars per piece. Um, but we're seeing uh, the range uh, go from three to six dollars, and that's just three dollars per piece, uh, not including customs and import costs and things like that. Um, now the issue is. Uh, they're looking for orders on the order of a million units per week or more. And if you flip all the way over to the other side on the demand side, you know, large hospitals are looking for typically 100,000 units of N95 masks per week. So that creates an immediate challenge because the terms that these manufacturers are looking for, you heard Whitney uh, allude to this, they typically look for a 50% upfront uh, uh, requirement and then a 50% on ship. So somewhere in this process, there has to be this financing for the supply and then that financing has to be unbundled across uh, a whole host of potential destinations. Uh, and that chain in, uh, could involve a number of different um, waypoints. It includes um, clearing customs uh, and the risk of confiscation that you'll hear um, Tian talk uh, a bit about. Um, there's brokers that can provide some of this financing function uh, that typically charge for uh, financing the, uh, the, the, the purchases from, uh, from the suppliers in Asia. Um, I, you know, we've seen a range of brokers, you know, some normal actors kind of in that 5 to 8% surcharge range to some potentially, you know, bad actors or what we would characterize as bad actors. Um, you know, kind of using this opportunity to really jack up prices and adding up to 50% overhead or more. But then, you know, as we move forward, there's still another fundamental problem here, which is guaranteeing quality. Uh, we can get documentation on FDA certifications, we can guarantee, you know, NIOSH certifications, but we've got a supply chain that's largely oriented around procuring from well-known vendors like 3M. And so, connecting the certifications they have to the actual product. Unfortunately, there's a lot of um, talk and press about bad actors and counterfeit products. And so how do you attest to the quality of these products so that uh, the healthcare providers and first responders and those folks are not exposed to liability uh, in a way, you know, in years down the line. And so it turns out there's a, a challenge there to guarantee and attest to quality at this scale. And then finally, the way that you know healthcare organizations, hospitals specifically, buy is particularly unique. For those of you that uh, may not be familiar, every hospital ultimately needs to buy the same stuff. So what they do is they aggregate a lot of their purchases through these organizations called group purchasing organizations. Uh, it's essentially, you know, my version of this is it's kind of like Groupon for hospitals. And what they do is they uh, combine all their orders together. And uh, the, the issue with these group purchasing organizations is they're oftentimes seeing efforts like ours as potentially competitive or conflicts of interest. They're unwilling to share what standards that they look for. Uh, they're very you know, accustomed and have processes around per procuring from companies like 3M. Anytime you create a new source of supply, uh, there is a general reluctance uh, for them to participate uh, for a whole variety of reasons. And, you know, hopefully we can find some folks that are potentially more innovative there. But the net of this is in order to get supply that does exist today, in order, in order to get that supply to demand requires some innovation, which is not just pure product innovation. It's innovation at all these levels in the supply chain, whether it's financing or customs or just bundling and aggregating demand. Uh, it turns out there's some innovation required here uh, that just does not exist. And, and I think that that really reflects a lot of the complexity that we've led to uh, or that we've discovered in our in our experience here. None of us, to be clear, none of us are experts here. Uh, and I think we're all learning as uh, as we go. And so, you know, the more help, uh, the better. Uh, but let me let me give uh, the mic over to Tian here, who uh, is intimately familiar with uh, with dealing with uh, uh, import export out of China. I think he'll be able to, to share some interesting details.
Thanks, John. Um, appreciate everyone joining on this call. Um, we're definitely in unprecedented times. My personal experience um, in terms of sourcing masks uh, range from first starting with a grassroots um, effort with a group of MIT friends where we imported 1,600 masks for friends um, to eventually coordinating with a group of grassroots organizers and in the process of importing 10 to 20,000 masks um, across four or five different locations to uh, most recently helping a national retail chain source uh, hundreds of thousands of masks for their essential workers. So I've definitely seen a wide range of, um, of uh, uh, on the logistics and supply chain side in terms of demand and Sean alluded to how the challenges are very much different depending on the size and, and that's certainly true. Um, what, uh, what I want to share with you guys is some of the learnings um, around sort of these key steps of the mask supply chain. And um, what's, what's interesting and frustrating is that the steps are all the same, but the days continue to change. Um, the time optimization is the critical part that makes this challenge particularly hard. Um, Globalization, um, really, we optimize for cost. And what that meant was we traded, um, you know, immediate faster routes for slower ocean routes. And so, and also it meant that global supply chains meant that we were sourcing from different countries. So um, when all of a sudden you have a demand spike, uh, it's very much um, hard to, for the supply to catch up. Um, even if the production is in place, uh, there's shipping times as required. So what traditionally has been an ocean freight um, uh, logistics route changed to an air freight route. So over the, past, uh, over the past month or so, what we've seen is that the bottleneck has shifted from sourcing and vetting manufacturers, finding production capacity, to most recently having enough planes and uh, uh, to, to carry the products over, and then also dealing with regulations. And uh, in, in particular, at the beginning of uh, the uh, epidemic, uh, the pandemic, uh, it was actually on the FDA side, on the US regulation side, where only certain masks um, were allowed to be used by um, hospitals. And that limited what hospitals could do in terms of purchasing decision. Over time, the CDC and the FDA has relaxed those rules, but in response, what has happened is uh, Chinese customs have, where most of the mass production capacities are in the world, have tightened their uh, standards. And it's actually for good reason. It's because they were concerned about the quality of masks that were coming out. Um, but the unintentional consequences is that what used to take maybe zero to one days um, for masks to pass through foreign export control that you see there now has changed to anywhere from three to well over a week, um, depending on the type of logistics route you're taking, whether it's international parcel through FedEx or um, you're doing air freight, um, where, which is larger, larger bulk quantity. So those are sort of the challenges that uh, in, on the supply chain side, whether it's a grassroots organizer trying to order a small shipment to a larger bulk purchase, constantly making trade-offs between cost, time, and uncertainty. Um, so that's, th those, those are the challenges um, that, that everyone tries to solve for. And from week to week, it changes because a regulation could mean that all of a sudden the bottleneck changes. So if, if let's say, tomorrow Chinese customs relax their rules, then the bottleneck completely shifts to the flights and shipping side. And so um, the critical observations, I think, is because it's a supply chain, it's only as strong, the chain is only as strong as the weakest link. And it's a constant adaptation of where the weakest link is and finding solutions. So on the supply chain initiative side, there are a lot of people tr trying to solve this problem. Some are taking a horizontal, approach, um, focusing on particular steps in the supply chain. And then others are taking a vertical integration approach where they're trying to source direct where they're trying to match supply and demand. Um, and 
uh, there's, I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way. It's, we have to parallel process and do everything. Um, it's about matching the right type of supply with the right type of demand. And so um, I think it gets to the problem side of things, which is really focusing on uh, these couple of big questions, which I'll have uh, Sean talk about. Yeah, no, thanks a lot, Tian. Oh, uh, am I muted? No, I'm not muted. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Tian. Um, yeah, I, just like Tian said, I think the, the challenges are changing week to week. I think, you know, I'm kind of following the group chat here, and I think people are highlighting how things are changing week to week. And so I think, you know, from one week to another, we don't know exactly what the challenge will be. And, you know, I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think this, this session is hopefully a, um, a call for anybody who might have some real expertise here to get involved. And you saw a list of various initiatives there. Feel free to reach out to me, Max, or Tian, or Shuja, or anybody here uh, organizing, and we'll see if we can get you pointed toward uh, some efforts that might make a ton of sense here uh, for you to, to be involved with. Um, and uh, we'd appreciate any, obviously, any help. And if you're working, if you're feeling like you're trying to help and looking for others to hook, link up with and solve some problems you're running into, hopefully the session can be helpful towards that end. All right, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, so yeah, I want to be respectful of time. Sean. So, yeah, exactly. So um, I think the, there are a lot of like interesting questions and we want to deep uh, dive deeper into them. And that's what the breakout sessions are for. So let's move on to the next section, uh, which is the second part of that, right? So while the supply chain is kind of constrained and we're trying to fix that, what are some alternative solutions? How can you hack some way of bridging the gap? And we're gonna break this down into two parts and we're gonna, I'm gonna invite uh, Sabrina and Karen to sort of quickly introduce yourselves and go over sort of hacking uh, by using new alternative materials. So Sabrina, over to you. Hi, my name is Sabrina Passman. I have a mechanical engineering and product design background and I've been really diving deep into why N95 masks are our golden standard and how we can achieve that. Karen, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Karen. So I have uh, both product supply and manufacturing experience along with R&D experience working with actually multiple non-woven suppliers. Awesome. So to really dive deep into this solution, we're going to go into understanding why N95 masks are revered as the only acceptable level of protection against COVID-19. So uh, next slide. Why? So the first thing we have to understand is how is this virus actually spread? Next slide. Um, in general, there's not a lot of research on COVID-19 specific viruses, but generally for viruses are known to spread through aerosolized particles. Uh, aerosolized particles are spread through coughing, talking, and sneezing. And the reason why this is so dangerous is that these particles hang out in clouds in the air. They don't have enough mass to drop all the way down to the floor. So uh, because of this, you're basically surrounded by gases of this, this virus. Um, so the next question is how far can these particles actually travel? The consensus originally was that it could only spread six feet, but recent research actually shows that it can hang around in clouds and travel up to 27 feet. So this problem is not going to be uh, simply uh, something to stay, stay far away apart from each other. Uh, it's something that these are in the air. How can we protect ourselves? Um, next slide. So the next thing is, okay, how big are these particles? Like if we needed to block ourselves from them, uh, how much do we actually have to filter out? So um, in a study of the influenza virus, 42% of these virus particles are found in things that are smaller than one micron. So that's extremely, extremely small. So actually how big is that? So we're comparing it here to a human hair, um, 0.1 microns for the virus containing particle and a human hair is on the order of 75 microns. Next slide. So that's to scale. So um, it's not something that we can just slap a cotton filter on top of our faces and call it good. Um, the filtration capability of the filter material needs to be extremely high in order to actually protect ourselves. Next slide. So who actually needs N95 level protection? Um, the current consensus is that healthcare workers need it, of course. But my stance is that if we actually need to protect each other from actually spreading this, everyone needs N95 level protection. Anyone that's in, within 27 feet of another person that's entering a cloud in which someone has breathed into needs protection. Um, and that's why certain solutions are better than others. Uh, next slide. 
So now we're getting into how does an N95 mask actually work. So to really simplify it, it's basically just a net that you put on your face. Imagine like a mosquito net, something that keeps bad things out and something that keeps all the bad things in if you're sick yourself. So what are the two criteria for making an effective net? Next slide. The two criteria are fit and filtration. And let's dive into what that means. So here we have a top-down view of a person shoving a net over their face. Um, there's three levels of filtration displayed here. On the left, we have bad filtration. You see that the mesh is very coarse that he's putting over his face, and that's letting a lot of particles through. If you go over to the right-hand side, you see good filtration as with a very fine mesh that actually filters out the correct size of particle. So that's general over filtration. On the fit side, fit is equally important as filtration. We're gonna go back a couple slides. There you go, cool. So take a look at fit. Um, fit is just as important as filtration. And if your net does not fit to your face, you're going to be inhaling those particles through the sides of the mask. So a lot of the solutions out there advertise a filtration capability, but they need to fit to your face in order to actually be effective. And you can see in this photo here on the left-hand side, particles are being inhaled because it's not sealed well to the face. On the right-hand side, it's good. All right, so next slide. So fit and filtration are both important. I'm gonna hand it over here to Karen to describe uh, how N95 masks work and from a material standpoint. All right, so what's inside the N95 is really a piece of filter material and that filter material is a melt blow non-woven, right? The reason why you know N95s work the way that they do and they're so effective is because this melt blow material is made of very like ultra fine fibers of very small diameters that pretty much provide a very like compact and efficient filtration network, right? If you look at that second box, right, melt blown versus the top diagram, like obviously, right, um, melt blown is much more effective at keeping out like very small particles from being inhaled. Um, for perspective, right, a fabric thread is on the scale of 10 times larger in diameter versus a single melt blown fiber diameter. Um, so again, like N95s, right, um, the, like, the composite material that it's really made of, it's commonly referred to as an SMS. I'll go back one slide. So SMS is really just um, spun bond, melt blown, spun bond sandwich, right? It's really combining the like primary benefits from the two different materials, which are essentially the strength and the, the like tensile strength and durability of a spun bond, right? With the, you know, weaker melt blown, but having that like very strong like microstructure to be able to filter. Next slide. So in general, this diagram is just sort of summarizing like at the very top bar, that is the filtration effect, um, efficiency of a N95 like or a surgical mask compared to kind of like, you know, like more everyday materials that are like lying around, right? So you can see that obviously there is superior filtration efficiency. And again, this really comes down to that melt blown filter layer that is on the inside of the mask. So, you know, like melt blown, right? These materials, it's common, right? It's being produced across the world. Like, why can't we just take, you know, the melt blown from a diaper pad or a, you know, menstrual pad and start using these to kind of like uh, enhance and open up the capability for um, increasing mass supply, right? It all comes down to material spec, right? I'm not gonna drive my Corolla down a racetrack when I can use a Ferrari. Um, the melt blown material specifications for a diaper pad will be very different from the melt blown material spec for a, um, that's being used in a mask, right? So all of these things tie together to impact the material specification that needs to be then, you know, successfully tested when you are like um, passing these masks through like quality tests, right? And all of these material specs also inherently tie back to the production lines capability and all of the process controls that go into that, right, to produce the output need. So these are just some quick questions. Um, we'll go through them in the breakout session and anyone that has any more like um, specific material questions either based on like melt blown or spin bond like processes, like definitely happy to go over those. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna sort of keep it rolling. Uh, so we're gonna switch over to the next side of Hacking New Solutions. And I'm gonna invite Umema Mendro to sort of talk to us about uh, her journey and how she pivoted to a consumer uh, solution. So over to you, Umaima. Great, thank you, Sujita. It's great to be here, guys. Um, I'm Umaima Mandro, and I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Vita. 
Um, my professional background is all in product management in software development. I um, spend majority of my career in the tech industry um, with an educational background in human development and computer science from Cornell and MBA from Harvard. Um, so Vita is a San Francisco based company and uh, what we do is we work with creatives and manufacturers from around the world to create unique products that are produced just in time on demand and at scale. Um, so you can see, you know, we had some know how and network to potentially bring to bear. Um, that's kind of the background on the company. So as COVID, um, you know, started to kind of emerge in the US. Um, I would say late sort of February, early March, um, we just like everybody else, you know, shifted to working from home, um, spending my days on, you know, keeping my company running. But um, at a personal level, you know, my nights and weekends were all spent on just learning about this dire shortage of PPEs um, and really looking at, you know, what's happening in different countries, you know, the countries that are able to flatten the curve uh, more effectively than what it looks like that we will be able to do. Um, what is different about it? Mask wearing countries, non-mask wearing countries. The fact that, you know, and a lot of this is just purely from the perspective of everyday consumer, but, you know, soon we realized, hey, a patient could be asymptomatic for up to two weeks, right? So they don't even know they have COVID, they're out and about. 50% um, or more of patients, um, you know, would not have a symptom at all, even when they have COVID. And then to add to that, um, you know, once you get a COVID test, there's up to 30 to 50% false negatives in the COVID test, um, which does bother me that we don't talk about that enough, especially in the context of, you know, isolating and contact tracing. Um, but so, you know, my goal was really, can we utilize our resources? You know, what is the most important thing that my company in this moment in time can do to really address the challenges um, on hand. And meanwhile, that was happening. And I was, you know, trying to make, this is my personal sewing machine, trying to make these um, masks at home. You know, the idea was that we make it with a pocket and then I was trying to source all these materials that um, Sabrina and Karen know a lot more um, about, you know, 100% polypropylene, where can I get it from? All these consumer products that we could get it from. That was happening. And at the same time, um, each of our factories, so we have you know, over um, a dozen or so factories around the world in the US, Turkey, Pakistan, India, they all started to shut down. Um, so we were starting to kind of see, you know, do we move our product that we do for Vita in the normal course of business to places that are actually starting to open up? And at that point, that was uh, China and, uh, and Hong Kong. And then we started to ask those places, can we source uh, masks from you guys? Um, high demand product um, for sure, but you know, that's really kind of where, where we started. And so we kind of found this um, needle in haystack uh, with a factory that my CEO and I, I believe Henrik is here as well. Um, Henrika Langberg, she had a relationship with them for over 10 years. She's lived in China uh, for several years and you know, sourced uh, products from um, all around the world, including China. Uh, but that particular location was interesting to us because Hangzhou, as some of you might know, you know, was talked about in the World Economic Forum as well as one of the places that really just took you know, COVID head on and did very early successful intervention. And so they opened up much before others. And so um, it was March 31st um, when we were still talking to a couple of factories. But then March 31st, we um, gave our first order um, to this factory in Hangzhou. And three days later, we actually launched the product uh, on the site. So we didn't have a sample in hand. Um, we didn't know the product. And Shuja, you might want to go back to that slide. Um, yep, so uh, April 3rd, we launched the product. Just to give you a little bit of a personal note there, April 3rd was also when I found out that I had COVID. So I started uh, my quarantine on that same day, uh, day 19 of quarantine, day 23 of uh, COVID symptoms. Um, but this does come, you know, close to uh, close to heart and close to home. So our top priority was to really try to make this product more effective than um, a homemade mask. What I could see, you know, even back then is that, you know, there were millions and millions of homemade masks that were being produced. How can we increase that um, effectiveness? So we secured this product, which is basically 100% um, cotton, um, you know, mask 
comes with a filter, which is a five layered activated carbon PM 2.5 filter, has two layers of melt blown polypropylene, um, and then one layer of activated carbon. So it's a, you know, is this filter super, I don't know, super thin. Um, and then this is, uh, this is, this is our mask. I think Sabrina, you talked about this, but you know, for us, it was also really important that it is a snug fit. So, you know, we have a um, kind of integrated metal uh, piece at the nose and then um, basically a adjustable earlobe. So trying to, you know, really see how we can make these products, you know, actually work um, in, in real life. We haven't done testing yet. We've been looking at a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, potential paths and Henrika can also share some of the learnings there. I would love to, you know, hear from, um, from all of you as well. And I think one thing that, you know, was important there is that, yeah, we're not trying to take away from N95s. Um, we're trying to be better than the, you know, cotton masks that, you know, can be more widely uh, produced um, and really sort of fit that sweet spot. This just to share with you, um, maybe one of my proudest moments um, of, you know, four years of running this company. But uh, we were donating 10% of our profits, which is our EBITDA, you know, so profit after all expenses to uh, SF Marin and um, a food bank and the New York food bank. And um, just from profits last week, we are able to uh, deliver 400,000 meals um, to people specifically impacted by COVID. And what they're saying is that it's, it's huge. You know, the, the need there is huge. Then the final thing, this is something that we're, you know, working on right now. Um, I'll share it very briefly, but, you know, as we all know, you know, COVID hit on the one hand, and then on the other hand, you know, the economic impact, right? So the health impact and the economic impact. And so the thought was for us, our core model is working with independent designers and manufacturers, meet that demand and supply a little bit like, you know, the one billion mask kind of concept. But here the thought is, you know, there's millions and millions of people who are now unemployed. Um, making the simple, basic cotton mask is not difficult. Um, and adding a filter, we can source that filter. So how can we build a model that might be a distributed in-home manufacturing model here in the U.S., employing people who um, lost their jobs? If, if I look at sort of my back of the envelope, there's a way to do this by actually paying people uh, 50% or 100% more than the, the minimum wage. Um, so both this as well as the, the last thing that I shared, um, love to sort of talk to people who might be interested in, um, you know, any, any part of this. Cool. Thank you, Umaima, for sharing such a personal journey. I could not find a mask, so I decided to grow, grow a beard. Uh, and that brings us to the next section on fixing the max, mask. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Sabrina for the next section. Great, next slide. So uh, I approached this problem similarly at first uh, to finding a carrier for an effective filter. But after looking at the, filtr the filtration materials available on the market, there aren't really that many that are held to the N95 standard. So my goal was to actually find a filtration material that would be as effective as this. What I found was that surgical masks are actually have a very similar stack up and ASTM level surgical masks are held to the same filtration efficiency. And as a mechanical engineer, looking at these two different options, this one is a much more efficient use of time for utilizing our filtration material. The only issue with this one is that it does not seal well to the face. So the brainstorm that I brought the engineers together for was to figure out how to seal a surgical mask well to the face. Um, we have two concepts thrown here. Actually, the second one is what we came up with first. And then as we are shelter in place, prototype the first one, realized it was immediately effective, went forward with that. Um, we have preliminary fit testing data, and we've proven that our solution outperforms an N95, including on some people that an N95 has never fit their faces before, so that's extremely promising. The remaining thing that we're waiting on, though, is passing the NIOSH standard of 42 CFR 84. Um, I've, I've shown this solution to CDC employees themselves being like, look at this, like, why wouldn't this work? And they respond basically saying that uh, surgical masks are inferior because they don't pass our testing standard. Um, I've tried to look at the differences between the testing standard of the NIOSH versus ASTM. We're actually going to go into this in the second session um, a little bit more in depth. But um, that said, this is the best filtration material that we found. We have qualified that fit is as good as an N95. And so from my standpoint, this is the best solution moving forward. 
Additionally, surgical masks are on the order of 300 times faster to produce than N95s. They're efficient basically in all different aspects. Um, more efficient use of material, more efficient use of time. So uh, I think this actually has the potential to solve our global shortage if we can utilize our resources properly. So thanks. Thank you, uh, Sabrina. Uh, we have had a last minute cancellation. Uh, the maker czar at MIT, uh, Professor Marty Culpepper has been called in to a meeting to help save lives. So uh, I'm sure that takes a lot more priority than coming in and sharing his thoughts with us. But I'm gonna, in the chart window, I'll uh, put in a video for the MIT face shield, which essentially is a one piece flat uh, sheet they have been able to create and in a matter of two hours and now like producing over 100,000 uh, uh, a day. And there's an open source pro, uh, plan and anybody can, can take it and use it without any royalty. Um, so with that, I'm gonna move on to, oh, there are a couple of questions we're gonna discuss and we do that in the breakout session. Uh, and the link is in the chat window. Please feel free to go and join in over there. So that brings us to the next section, which is how do we do quality testing of new supplies? So I'm gonna hand it over to Gail for this uh, next section. Hi, thank you very much, Shuja. So I, I think as we've already heard, there's all kinds of ideas that people have uh, been pursuing to try and increase the supply um, or to change the materials or the design of the mask to make it more effective. But that really brings up this question of how do we know if the masks are that we're buying or that are getting delivered are actually meeting the quality or if the design itself uh, actually will perform the way that it's supposed to to protect the people uh, either in the healthcare setting or in the home setting um, from COVID-19. So um, I'm going to be joined here by uh, Sabrina Paisman and Kelly McGee um, and they're going to help us uh, talk through some of their experiences uh, in terms of testing that they've, ex they've come across during spinning up their, their own companies um, to supply or design masks. Um, so, so Sabrina, maybe you could start. I just have both Sabrina and Kelly introduce themselves and their respective companies, Fix the Mask and Elevate Medical. Sabrina, do you want to go first? Okay, sure. I sort of touched upon Fix the Mask already, so I won't bore yes. you guys the details, but yep, we can move on. Oh, okay. Kelly. Hey, everybody. I'm Tom McGee, um, 2017 from MIT. Uh, we have a product design firm out here in San Francisco focusing on sort of new age medical devices. And we fortunately um, have a facility that do, does all of our manufacturing in China that we have a partnership with. So our team of engineers kind of got together and rather than sort of come up with ideas for new products about how to solve this problem, we sort of took all of our manufacturing lines in China and pushed them to the side and opened up new manufacturing lines to create masks um, as well as now face shields. So um, we've been in the thick of uh, trying to figure out how do we you know, handle logistics, quality, engineering, um, and just, you know, delivery of all these products um, over the past four weeks. So it's been a tremendous effort by our team, but it's been really eye-opening to see all the issues that um, everyone's brought up today firsthand. Great, thanks very much. Um, so um, I got into this just through um, hacking personal uh, mass design for home use. Um, and even at that level, it was apparent when looking into these standards that they're extremely complex. Um, Sabrina, I was wondering if you could just tell us based on your own research, you know, first, what are the things that, that need to be tested with respect to N95 masks? Um, and then we can dive in a little bit more to the specific standards. Absolutely. So as I mentioned from the function of a mask, fit matters and filtration matters. What size of filtration matters? on the order of 0.1 micron particles. And so if you take a look into the standards qualified by the CDC, NIOSH, FDA, ASTM, and there's also some international standards, you'll see that they break them down in terms of these different criteria. Um, there are different ways to, so actually one thing that I want to highlight is that a lot of times you'll see something called bacterial filtration efficiency advertised on all of these masks that are being produced all around the world. That's not necessarily relevant for COVID-19 because of the small aerosolized particles. And so as a consumer, as you're looking through mask solutions, make sure that it's actually filtering down to the 0.1 micron particle. And N95 masks do that to 95% efficiency. So just as a reference. Um, so in my standpoint, there are uh, things also like there's humidity testing to make sure that the materials the masks are made of don't break down under um, 
different hum you know, humidity in general, um, and liquid barrier protection. So uh, liquid barrier protection is like splashes of blood is the, is the mask resistant to that. So all of these uh, matter, but in my stance, I think that fit and particle filtration efficiency are the two big ones that actually matter for COVID-19. Next slide. Great. Yeah, and if we could go to the next slide. Um, there's, there's a lot of information here, but, but Sabrina, could you just um, highlight the most important issues with respect to the US standards um, that sure. are gonna be used for these masks? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the golden standard for N95 masks uh, that's used for uh, all of the 3M N95s that you'll see around is um, a standard called 42 CFR 84. It's testing a bunch of different aspects of the design. Um, but it's actually a conflated study that actually tests fit and filtration. And in the breakout session, we'll go down into exactly how the test is set up and how I think uh, we can go into my, my thoughts later. Um, this table to focus you back on the slide is on the left hand side showing the differences between the filtration standards between different countries. So if you take a look, actually, this is a table done by smartairfilters.com. I take no credit for it. Um, but you see that within China versus Europe versus the US, there's actually different standards that are being held to. And that's why it's so dangerous when we have 80% new vendors sort of surfacing on the market and that have never done any regulatory work before. Um, they can claim different filtration efficiencies, but are they actually referring to the right standards? Or are they actually doing the right tests? So that's something I just sort of want to put in everyone's minds. Um, and on the FIT side, what's interesting is that there's no official isolated FIT test that is approved by the CDC that says if you pass this test, your FIT is good. But hospitals around the US use two different methods. One of the methods is a qualitative test. It's called uh, the saccharin slash bitters test. The way that it's performed is that a poor doctor puts a mask on their face, they shove their head inside of a bag and they release like really bad smelling gas inside of the mask. And if they smell the bag, <laughs> they smell it, it's a failed test. So sort of an archaic method, but that's actually 3M's top way to check fit inside of hospitals. So that's number one. The second way is something called a port account pro. That's also made by TSI, which is another uh, it's the manufacturer of all the testing equipment um, for all of the uh, CDC's tests. The port account pro outputs a fit factor. Um, it does a ratio of the amount of particulates inside of a mask versus outside of a mask after a certain amount of time. Uh, We'll go into more detail later in the breakout section if you're interested, but basically the fit factor above 100 means that you passed to an N95 standard. Below 100 means you have failed. So those are the two methods. Okay, great. Thanks very much. So now if I could go to Kelly. So your company is manufacturing masks in China. Um, can you talk to us about the experience of uh, that you guys went through in terms of deciding how to handle testing and how that's changed as the FDA changes their recommendations uh, over time. Yeah, definitely. From the start of sort of all of this um, happening, both in China and the US, um, testing uh, requirements and what the CDC and the FDA agreed upon to be sort of um, appropriate for medical and general purpose use as it pertains to 95% uh, particulate efficiency respirators changed almost daily. So um, the CDC and the FDA almost weren't aligned until um, the April 3rd emergency use authorization was um, released. And now that's provided more guidance on what to do for medical uh, workers as well as the general public if you cannot find an N95 respirator. Um, I posted a link on the chat here and you can find it online, but there's tons of um, uh, charts that show the different testing standards globally for different types of respirators. You may have heard of a KN95 respirator, which is um, China's version of an N95. And in the US, we have what we call the N95, which 3M is the largest supplier. Um, the testing standard in the United States and the testing standard in China are completely different um, just because that's what they use domestically. However, this, the testing methods are similar um, you know, in their sort of ge generic makeup. Um, however, the US you know, only, require, you know, only constitutes something as an N95 if it passes that ASTM standard. In China, it's called the GB2626-2006. In Europe, it's called the EN149-2001. There's a ton of them that you can check out. Um, but those different regions won't accept that mask as sort of acceptable unless it's met those standards. So my team um, had a little bit of an issue with this um, because uh, the KN95 mask, which is the fastest and easiest to produce, um, has had a lot of fraudulent um, sort of claims behind it, especially meeting um, both, you know, the Chinese standard and sort of other global region standards. So 
Um, what our team did was actually test our KN95 for the European standard because we felt like the, from an you know, engineering perspective on that spec, it was actually a higher, um, you know, it was testing the product to a higher level than the Chinese version. And that's allowed us to sort of get in the door um, and get past sort of some of the concerns that a lot of medical folks have in the country. So um, I think that's just, you know, a little bit of background information there, but as seen in the slides here, there's some testing centers in the US and Canada, which are sort of the go-tos. Um, it's a little bit hard to get into uh, their testing centers right now because of, you know, sort of uh, shelter in place and work from home scenarios. So um, that's also um, something that's helped pulling people back I think from creating new solutions, both domestically and abroad. Um, yeah. So one uh, one final question for you, Kelly. So when you're working with your customers, how are they viewing acceptance tests for for your products? Yeah, that's a really critical one. I think um, you know right now, unfortunately, FEMA and the United States government aren't necessarily providing um, from this national stockpile that we've heard about. Um, as, uh, as sort of quickly as I think everyone expected. So everyone's sort of on their own from both hospice care centers to hospitals to nursing care centers. Um, and each one of those individuals that are on a procurement or sourcing team has to basically vet for themselves whether or not testing data is legitimate. So um, that's been a really difficult thing because everyone is obviously has their fraudulent meters on high. Um, and so our team is trying to make more of a personal connection um, through all those centers and show our testing data and walk everyone through it uh, because it can be, you know, confusing and um, definitely can perceive be perceived to be fraudulent right now. Great. So um, we, let's see. There we have we have some questions that um, that we're going to be handling uh, in more detail in the breakout sessions, or as we talk to people who join us in those breakout sessions, there may be expertise there that uh, will significantly add to. To these experiences, but you can tell there's a lot of issues in, in testing um, that we're going to have to face. Um, and I think, given our, our time, we'll we'll jump directly into the next session. Thanks very much, Kelly and uh, Sabrina. Um, okay, so the next the next section here is about um, decontamination and reuse of masks, and I'm going to be joined by Manu Prakash. Hopefully Manu is there. Can you all hear me? Yes, great, good. Um, so um, reuse of an N95 masks has, has come up as people have been creative in coming up with how do we extend the supply. We have, we've already gone over in great detail the fact that there really aren't enough right now. Um, and so reuse is an obvious question. Um, there's been a lot of work in this space, and Manu uh, is, is here to help talk us through some of those things. Um, he's professor of bioengineering at Stanford and received his master's and PhD in applied physics from MIT. Um, but he's also part of the N95 DECON consortium, uh, which has uh, formed a really powerful clearinghouse as a collection of you know, publications and best practices on N95 reuse. So, Maybe you could just jump right in, Manu, and tell us how did you get involved with this, and why was it needed, and and who was the primary audience as well for this? Yeah. So first of all, thanks for having me. A uh, couple of comments before I start. Uh, I'm a faculty at Stanford. Uh, I think a lot of information that's being shared it's, it's also in a rapid fire format in a Zoom call. Uh, the one comment that I have is it's. Uh, this is all complex information. It's very valuable to then go back and dive in. So a lot of things that I'll just mention are all on the website, just n95decon.org. It's very important. You know, this is, for some people, it's uh, information between life and death. So uh, with these fast formats, it becomes really hard. So just make sure that you actually go in and look at the documents. Um, I think the beginning of much of what we have done and how it came about was we saw uh, there's been, first of all, if you have access to a fresh N95, that's what you should use. These N95 objects were made to be disposable uh, and there's been very little work that was done in the past in thinking about decontamination. And so one of the things that we started looking at, first of all, is my lab uh, at Stanford uh, and then we started realizing that a lot of academics and groups across the country were thinking about this issue. 
And that came together as a consortium of uh, roughly around 100 or so scientists and academics. We are an unbiased entity. And uh, one of the primary goals for us has been, how do you really make sense of literally thousands of these publications in the context of how N95 masks work? How do these treatments work? The context of how you would actually decontaminate a virus a virus that nobody has had access to before. I mean, these are a class of coronaviruses, but this is not exactly uh, COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2. A very little experimental work has been done in that space. So the goal of our organization, which is a nonprofit now, is to disseminate the best possible practices that we can find that are grounded in science share that as rapidly as possible. So the, as in terms of audience, the audience refers to be hospitals that are trying to implement uh, protocols as we speak right now, healthcare workers themselves that are putting on these masks on their faces every day and are not sure whether their decontamination protocols are actually uh, at par. And then the other aspect of this is also federal agencies. We share all our work publicly. We share them with organizations, uh, uh, you know, not just locally, but globally. And we've had many contacts and conversations uh, to try to build consensus in that space as well. There is a literature review part of this component that you've all seen uh, if you look through the website, but there is also an experimental component where we are trying to fill the gap between what is not known about these sets of decontamination procedures. So many of those experimental protocols will come online. Um, the SOPs were released literally three days ago that help hospitals actually implement some of these ideas as well. Uh, but one of the things that we do is we do that in partnership with hospitals and primarily provide procedures that have been implemented by other hospitals. Uh, so I can talk a little bit about uh, sets of uh, promising methods per se, uh, but again, uh, the caveat would be I would much rather just do that in terms of questions uh, because of the complexity. And so if you go to the next slide, um, yeah, so this is just a template holder of the kinds of documents that we produce. So to the right is literally these uh, white papers that the groups have been working on. There are multiple technical teams behind these. Uh, but then on the left is something, a summary digest of uh, what uh, somebody can grasp when they're starting to implement a process. Uh, and one of the challenges with this is we want to highlight the fact that there is no one button solution. There are lots of complications when you're thinking about decontamination. So say for example, you know, fit infiltration was brought up a few minutes ago a certain sort of a method can actually damage uh, the fit of a mask while the filtration efficiency remains perfectly the same. While the other way around, another method could damage the filtration while the fit remains the same. Uh, so it's very valuable to make sure that when you look at these documents that you are carefully going through the sets of highlights. And again, these sets of documents are uploaded. So for example, with certain sets of methods, uh, very recently, an NIH paper just came out that has shown data for COVE-2. So all of these are updated live. So the next version of documents would be online pretty soon. Uh, one of the things that I was going to mention is that the group is quite focused not only on large-scale hospitals. So say when you look at hydrogen peroxide solutions, there are large companies like Battelle and others that are providing solutions for large, high-throughput decontamination of masks. But if you're looking at a nursing home in the country or a small hospital or literally a, you know, a hospital in India and Bangladesh, those sets of things will not be accessible. So the way that we have chosen to do research on these sets of methods, so when you look at heat and humidity in UVC, for example, it's really also focused on small scale throughput and primarily folks that are not being provided a current uh, off the shelf solution. If there are off-the-shelf solutions that are FDA approved, that's actually great, you should use that. But on the other hand, majority of mask users fall into the category that they would have to look through these sets of methods. Um, and then the other aspect of N95 Decon, which I wanna bring up is how do you, there is a lot of noise right now in this entire uh, uh, 
uh, space of N95. And we've taken a lot of effort to make sure what not to do with these masks, for example. So say, for example, there is a lot of talk about leave your mask in sunlight. It is, you know, the UVC associated that you need for decontamination is literally a joule per centimeter square. So unless you meet that criteria, it is really a bad practice. Or for example, there are these nail salon UV sources that people have mentioned, and unless they've been measured, uh, it's actually not a good idea. And I mean, I think related to this as well, uh, the goal of the organization has also been is to validate as much information that we find that arises from these sets of sources. So for example, something that I just heard from Sabrina that I was confused that I was gonna ask was, uh, did I hear uh, her mention that a surgical mask has the same filtration efficiency at 0.1 to 0.3? microns, uh, uh, which would puzzle me a lot. And so maybe we can take that as a Q&A at a later time, Sabrina. I would love to kind of talk about that because uh, one of the threads- I would love to talk about that more as well. Yeah, uh, one of the threads about this work that we are trying to do is ensure that everybody's on the same page. There is consensus building and there is an internal review process. Uh, and again, of course, all our documents then can be reviewed and commented on by uh, broader sets of experts. Uh, and then I think in the closing, an important bit that I want to say is we all came to do this very much like all of you uh, in an hour of need. So of course we have many occupational health folks that literally do this for a living, but we also have everybody from virologist, physicist, chemist in that team. And the process of this team and consensus building, there is, it's a flat organization. Everybody has an equal say. We have a very stringent peer review process in what we are willing to actually put on on the site itself. But we are also, when we see information that does not meet the the criteria of scientific rigor that we are very open of actually pointing that out as well. So we are happy if any of you want to reach out, if any of these sources and uh, capacities uh, are valuable to any of you. Uh, it's a fairly open organization and our primary goal is to ensure both in the US and abroad uh, that much of this information of both how to use but how to decontaminate with limits because of course uh, this decontamination has uh, never been implemented at a large scale. So I'll stop there and I can take questions at a later time. Great, so I, th I think we're gonna try and uh, dive in during the breakout sessions uh, into the additional details and, and figure out whether the, you know, the big questions that we came up with are even relevant and whether there are bigger ones. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks very much for your participation. It's really great information for everybody to hear. Yeah, thank you everyone. And I think uh, the purpose of this uh, event was that there is a lot of information. People are, you know, a lot of like well-intentioned people trying to hack it with very limited information. Things are changing very rapidly. And, uh, you know, let's get all our collective intelligence together to discuss these in an open uh, forum, being respectful of each other and uh, try and debate. And as I think uh, Manu like very aptly put it that Look, I think there needs to be some level of like scientific rigor to behind it, and this is this is awesome, and that that is the spirit of this uh, event. So with that, uh, I think Serena, uh, who Serena, if you want to come in and okay. just walk us through, she's going to be splitting us up into uh, three or four uh, breakout sessions where we will continue this discussion, and um, the speakers will continue on in those sessions as well, and. Uh, uh, be, uh, and will participate over there. So over to you, Serena. Thank you. So I set up uh, a total of six breakout sessions, two of each topic. I took your um, answers on the Google spreadsheet to assign you to those breakout rooms. And whoever did not um, participate in that spreadsheet, I just distributed evenly among all the breakout rooms. If for whatever reason you wanna move to a different breakout room, I will stay in this main session so you, in, there, you can move to the main session and then I can then uh, assign you to a different room. Um, but with that, I'm ready to open up the room. Go for it. So in 30 seconds, we're gonna be transported off to different rooms.
and you'll have to join the room. Beam me, Scotty. No. <laughs> Are we supposed to get a notification, Serena? You're supposed to, yes. You may not because you're a co-host. Ah, but how so do I, I join? Know. I don't even see uh, meetings. So I can't force you to go into the meeting, Shuja. Hi, would you mind putting me in a test and decontamination breakout room? Uh, who is speaking? Corona Groff. What room are you in right now? I think I'm in a creating new solutions room. Corona Groff, okay. So you want to go into which one? Sorry. Uh, test and decontamination. Sure. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I don't know why you, uh, Shuja, you can't go into that because there's people in that room in the Hacking New Solutions. Maybe I'm going to are co-host. There are nine of us who are not in, different, in any new room right now. That's because you have to join it. But I, we, I didn't get a notification, but I don't know, like, uh, David, did you get a notification or Susan? I, I did. I'm coming back to the main to try to get to the breakout I want to go to. Ah, okay. Got it. David, uh, where do you want to go? Uh, one of the decontamination ones. Thanks. Oh, okay. I am going to hacking you soon. Sorry, David. Oh, I'm trying to look for you, David. Do you know what room you were in? Oh, I see. Just kidding, I can see you. David, move to testing and decontamination. Yes, please. All right. Thanks. I think I filled out the form and registration and was working yeah. on the whole screen, so I didn't fill out fill it out again. Yeah, we decided to just um, do it just in real time. So sure. thank you for doing that. Did you get the invitation? Because you still haven't joined that. No, I have not. Because I moved you there. If I click breakout rooms at the bottom of the screen, do I get to choose? Try doing that. You might just get beamed over there. Oh, yeah. Hi, um, this is Larry Dean. I signed up for session two, which is the uh, hack the new solution, but I was brought to this fix existing, existing solution sort of session. That's why I like, came back to the main session here, like to get uh, re redirected to the, the right one that I want to join. Sure. Uh, which one do you, hold on. The, one, the second one, which is the, uh, the new solution one. New solutions. Okay, go ahead. All right, very good. Thank you. Should I just wait? Well, do I need to do anything or just wait there? I think you need to go to the breakout session, the breakout okay. room. Oh, break. okay. Hi there. I got transported to the wrong session. How do I get back into the first? Uh, the uh, what session was that? The, the uh, fixing the. So say again. Fixing the fixing the, the, uh, fixing the current supply chain. Yeah, uh, can you also help me you know, switch me to that very out room? Uh, currently, yeah. it seems like I am at uh, uh, hacking new solutions, but uh, prefer- I have to run there too. Yeah. You have to click to join it, so- I did, as, uh, it, it brought me to the wrong session. Okay, John, you should be able to do that now though. Okay, I don't, where do I- I just click? moved you. Okay, hold on, I'm looking for- It's like breakout room. Okay, wait, I got you in the meeting. The problem is I think I got six monitors, so I, I can see that being a problem. Hold on one second. Uh, okay, there's Zoom, no. Oh, could you also- uh, Where did you send the link, <laughs> or is it? 
Also, could you help transfer me to the fixing supply chain room? Sure. Thank you. Can you reset? How do I? Yeah, I don't have a link on anything. There's no link is on the actual Zoom app. Okay, hold on. I see the Zoom app. Is it the blue arrow? Uh, no, people. I don't know what you see, unfortunately. Okay, sorry. Um, hmm. Okay, um, so there should be a button in the bottom that has four squares and it says join breakout room. Ah, you know what? There it is. I see it. Thank you. Nobody says fix it. Okay, there it is. Yeah. So it. could I get switched to Hacking New Solutions, please? Hacking New Solutions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I, have, I have the same request as well. Could you switch me as well? Sure. Let me find out where you are. To hacking new solutions, right? Exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, can you switch me over to supply chain? Supply chain. Supply chain. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, can you can you move me to uh, the, the hacking solution session? Hacking solution. Here we go. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. who can challenge each other's thinkings, uh, folks who could help each other out. And that's really the objective of this uh, session today was to you know, bring folks together who are interested in solving this problem, help each other, uh, challenge each other, extend our thinking, and hopefully together we can solve this. So um, I'm gonna uh, start off with, I guess, uh, room one in, uh, the adventures in the PPE supply chain. So I don't know, uh, can you sort of quickly summarize and we'll go through all the six rooms in nine minutes. So. Yeah, uh, so I think a quick summary, I think everyone sort of felt like they, the, the quick summary is it seemed like there were a lot of overlapping experiences. Uh, There's clearly a lot of experience that I think a lot of people had network connections. Um, the problems that we talked about seemed to resonate. I think the main takeaway here is let's start informally and create a good resource that we can all go to when we have these questions. And, you know, as things kind of change and as things become more repeated, maybe we can, maybe that leads to something more formal. Um, you know, I think Tian, it looks like we heard about Tian's Discord chat uh, from room two. And so that feels like a really great idea um, as a way to follow up. But, uh, but it does seem like there's a lot of links in the chain that we just don't have to reinvent. Um, but let's go figure out how we can um, get those dots all connected with uh, all of our individual efforts that uh, people are jumping in with. All right, cool. Room two. Yeah, so um, also on the supply chain, I think kind of the biggest two takeaways, and thank you, Tian, so much for already having the Discord chat. It's like we wanted to keep talking, but the two questions that I guess we kind of posed based off of the uh the findings are that like you know one so many people are having these problems and they don't even know where to go or who to go to you know why are there 80 or 100 different types of groups working on helping get ppe uh, and how do we create a system where people know who to talk to and then two how do we come up with an idea to help these groups work together to get more efficient because it seems like the decentralized approach is causing a lot of friction in solving this problem cool Awesome. So uh, let's move on to the next creating like innovative solutions. Um, and um, who's the moderator for that one? Karen. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So I'll just briefly summarize some of the topics we talked. Um, you know, we talked about DIY at mass versus the you know surgical and N95. Right. Um, there was a there's a solution right now that's like showing promising results. But you know, um, in the short term, does it make sense to kind of have a more like consumer ready mask that's more easily easily accessible for everyone? Um, something that's kind of like more mid tier that is still safe in like certain environments as communities reopen, right? Um, we have a Nelson Labs like point of contact who's happy to help. So all of that's being documented. 
And also uh, we had a really interesting discussion where, you know, um, Larry, one of the contacts actually has a solution that could kind of result in a reusable mask, right, to kind of like attack the virus. So all it would need is really to be combined with a sort of like mass production um, kind of like a scenario. Oh, awesome. Thanks, uh, Karen. Uh, in our room, I think uh, the topics we discussed were like four key areas people were really curious about. One is around um, sort of the use of masks for non-medical uh, 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 individuals. So whether they are sort of workers in retail stores or the most vulnerable population or staff in like nursing homes and so on and so forth. And uh, within that, we talked about sort of you know, how do you increase the coolness factor? Because if you go down the streets of like Palo Alto right now, like, you know, 5 p.m. there, nobody's really wearing masks, uh, uh, you know, and they're all out and about. How do you get like certification and on the materials and or the masks you're creating? Uh, and I think the consensus was that there's not much happening at the federal level. Uh, things should, seem to be shut down. So can you, can the state or the city government step up in those roles? Uh, and then along the same lines is that uh, rather than just like looking at existing materials, could you look at sort of alternative sort of ways of killing microbes? So Henry and his team have been working on sort of micro, uh, you know, uh, new materials which could sort of kill uh, microbes as they come into the mass. Um, but again, the challenge remains that how do you get those uh, new <laughs> you know, form of uh, uh, you know, certified and you know, mass produced when the uh, country is shut down. Uh, um, and then the last thing we talked about was around uh, sort of concerns people had was around like how you dispose use mass um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a responsible fashion. And then as you're consuming so many masks, how do you do that in a recyclable manner as well? Um, I think the things where we wanted to go further, but we didn't have time was around uh, you know, or how do we leverage resources in country uh, to create a new supply chain as well as, um, you know, people brought up like uh, issues around like, you know, field uh, surgery masks and their efficiency as, uh, as, uh, as an N95 mask. So uh, moving on, uh, Gail. Um, great. Uh, we, I think, uh, as you mentioned, we had a lot of a uh, lot of difficulty covering uh, as broad a number of experiences and stories and questions as we really wanted to, and a lot of uh, interest in extending the conversation. So I hope we can find a way to effectively do that. Um, the issues that we touched on, um, we talked on about um, in particular a couple of issues related to fit of masks, where even if you aren't, for instance, decontaminating a mask, but you just reuse it by wearing it multiple days, putting it on and off over five days, it'll start to um, fail because of fit um, parameters uh, no longer uh, working. We talked about um, uh, how lower cost, lower cost testing equipment would be a really uh, big benefit to reach a broader audiences because a lot of the testing equipment that's used is at a, a price point that is beyond a lot of the facilities that need to be able to do this testing. Um, and uh, there, there was some efforts shared about uh, progressing uh, on that front. Um, talked about test flow rates being the same as, you know, when we do do testing, uh, the flow rates that are being used really need to agree to human breathing pressure or they're not valid. Uh, oh, we, we also addressed uh, some questions about mask with vent valves. Um, the vent valve on a mask really makes it, it's, it, it's, it's still very effective for the person wearing it. However, it's no longer effective for uh, protecting people in the area from the person wearing it. Um, so that was a good clarification that was made. Um, and uh, Morton shared some really interesting experiences of trying to help nurses in Santa Barbara who were tasked with caring for the prison um, prison patients coming from Lompoc and the major issues that they had with, with mask fit and with saturation of masks because they were asked to wear masks for 12 hours at a time. Um, and just a lot of other things that were brought out that we didn't have time to get to. Oh, awesome. Uh, Sabrina? Sabrina, you may be on mute. Hi. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Um, we had a great conversation about uh, a couple of different aspects of the 
uh, testing side. Um, we identified that the testing criteria that are used uh, internationally seem to be sort of disparaging between the standards that we're using in the United States. Um, China has apparently brought up uh, on the order of 40 or so uh, qualified testing labs that are all now qualified. And if the materials that um, are being shipped out of country have not been tested by those facilities, they are stopped at the border and not allowed to leave. So that's really encouraging. Um, we were wondering if the U.S. could also bring up some testing labs like that. And it sounds like the reason why they haven't done that yet is because, um, I guess, resource constraints. Uh, I guess Kelly maybe can talk more about that side. Um, we also discussed uh, the difference between um, Dr. Du uh, Long, I don't want to pronounce your name wrong, um, uh, identified that there are differences between um, hospital environments versus non-hospital environments, but we didn't really get into as much of the details of that as I would like to. And so we're going to hopefully have a, a call following up afterwards to get more into the details. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. I think we want to be respectful of everyone's time. I think this is a good discussion. Two hours was way too short for this. Um, we'll send out an email and we also want to make sure we like sort of get a double opt-in so uh, before we share people's contacts with each other to collaborate, whether we use Discord or maybe I'm already too old in the demographics of the Discord uh, or you use some other platform to communicate and connect. So uh, we'll send that out to you, but thank you so much for your time and really appreciate it. And uh, let's keep this conversation going. Right. Thank you. Good. Thanks. And we have like everybody unmute themselves and say thank you to the uh, speakers. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for from Tanzania. Stay right. safe and be healthy. Thank you. Yeah, be safe. Be safe. Here, here. Thank be you for organizing.